everybody. Hope everyone had a nice lunch. Um, this morning we heard a lot about the history of work at Owens Lake in terms of dust control development and regulatory history and operations and maintenance. Um, this part of the presentations are talking about key constraints and considering alternative dust control sources that are not sources measures. Um, so I'm just going to introduce it and then I'm going to hand it off to Phil and Ann to um, uh, give the rest of the presentation. So here we have Ann and Phil. All right. The uh, things I wanted to cover for the district and our key constraints are provisions under the Clean Air Act Section 172E, and this is specific to no backsliding. And so, what this requires is a continuing progression towards the unattainment. And the place where we're at now at Owens Lake, we have a plan where we feel that we can reach that attainment designation. We have the provisions in the stipulated judgment, we have the provisions in the SIP, um, we have additional back end contingencies where we can actually make that progress towards attainment. The designation of attainment is basically three clean years in a row where you can't have an exceedance of the max more than once a year on average over that three year period. So you could have three a year, but you couldn't have any the next two, you have one a year for the three years. We're not there yet. And, um, we have some challenges ahead, some little pieces to clean up, um, but that's a really important part of the key constraints that we can't backslide on that progression. We have to maintain the control efficiencies and backroom requirements for the currently controlled areas. And as I think a lot of the presenters have already touched on today, just maintaining the operations, the infrastructure, um, perform the maintenance that is required to meet the performance criteria, the performance criteria of backroom, making sure it's quality is, quietness index is enough, making sure that it's roughness is good enough, doing the maintenance, having reflood orders, um, these are a lot of work as it is. So another component of this is the development of new or modified dust controls. So there's limitations on the testing of new and modified controls. There's limitations for whether or not you're gonna do a, a shallow flood refinement test or whether or not you're going to do a backup test or whether or not you just want to do some other test to find out how effective a control measure may work. You, know, you could do a pilot study test in a sensor resource area that we've got ideas for. Um, and then once those tests are done, there's other important considerations like the demonstration test, um, what the success is, what the durability is, what the reliability is, um, how long it can persist. Um, these are really important key constraints for us. No backsliding. Um, so, as Grace mentioned, the requirements of backup and its emissions reductions. The Clean Air Act requires that all best available control measures and all best available control technology on significant sources and PM10 attainment areas meet that 99% control efficiency as specified. This work at all times, day, night, winter, summer, hot, cold wet, dry, um, and those performance standards have to be met. <coughs> there are provisions for variances or circumstances that are outside of the reasonable control of DWP, so there will be breakdowns, um, but yet there are still limitations to those variances. If they can't go for more than a year, they have to be approved by the hearing board. Um, we've always had greater success together if um, the district and the DWP are on the same page requesting for a variance. Um, we can, um, under certain circumstances, require tests or request tests from DWP, and we've done that. We've done that with Diana Water Management. Mm -hmm. um, the compliance is ensured by evaluation of the performance standards, and each and every one of those dust control methodologies at Owens Lake have very strict um, performance standards. <laughs> A lot of them we still find challenging to achieve. Shallow flood wetness requirements for sprinkler areas. We had an overpass a week ago or so. And some of the areas that seem to be working very effectively meeting that compliance requirement were at 56%. So you're almost 20% below that required shallow flood requirement just because of the temperature, um, the soil types and conditions, and the ability to distribute that water and the frequency that that SCADA system or sprinkler system is coming on and off. So um, those are things that we have to ensure are met. 
And then one of the other things about the no backsliding and backroom requirements is that there's specific provisions that the backroom have to be approved by the air pollution control officer, myself. And to get my approval, um, it's very tough. But they need to approve all my staff first. So, you know, the it, it moves up the chain of command and it has to work through the experts in that field and testing and the scientific um, endeavors that are performed. Then once, if it were to receive my approval, it has to go to the district governing board or legislative bodies for their approval. Once that gets approved, then it would have to go on to the California Air Resources Board for approval. And finally, it has to go to the US EPA for approval. And to date, EPA has never approved any of all our modified backums or amendments to our SIP. They've only approved the 1998 SIP with the shallow flood, gravel, and vegetation. And then they approved the 2016 SIP and the provisions in that as well. So um, that was. I don't want to underestimate the monumental achievement of that 2016 SIP and getting the EPA approval. Um, it was a lot of work, a lot of trips to Sacramento, a lot of networking with CARB and EPA, and DWP, um, running the termination test of shallow flood periods for the dynamic water management, getting brine in there and tillage from the stipulated judgment, um, getting that support from our agencies that oversee us that these are actually going to work um, because they aren't the experts in the field, the Great Basin Air District and our staff. DWP as well, working in these environments all the time, then can bring that to carbon EPA and say, yeah, we're confident enough that this meets that 99%. Um, we support this and then EPA approved it. At that point, then of course, our SIP was in a regulatory freeze with the new presidential administration. So there were the 40 regulations that were frozen in January 2017 and our SIP was there for 60 days before the thaw, and then the EPA approval went through. So that's significant. I forgot to mention that earlier, so I wanted to bring that up. Right. Yeah. So building upon what Bill was discussing for um, anti-backsliding provisions, in the 2016 SIP, as well as the regulatory documents that accompany that, there were really specific provisions that were uh, included for the development of new and modified dust control. And I'm going to try to present this in a way that um, kind of speaks to the panel's first task. And so there's kind of two paths. And one I'm going to be referring to as backum development, and the other I'll be referring to as alternative dust control development. And as I go through this, hopefully those two paths are clear. And they're, they're not mutually exclusive, but um, starting with best available control measures, um, this map that was shown highlights the control efficiencies that are required for areas that have already been ordered. And so for the anti-backsliding provisions, those areas need to maintain those control efficiencies. And so to do so with consideration of new dust control, those need to be um, held to a high standard. And so for new best available control measures, there has to be a demonstration that sufficient PM10 control can be achieved and maintained under all conditions. And it has to include a margin of safety for the different environmental conditions that can occur in Owens Lake. So part of that testing, a requirement is that the testing can't be done in current ordered areas, provided that the backup of backup performance criteria for a currently approved backup has to be maintained. And so typically when different dust controls are being considered, it would be difficult to maintain the performance standard of an existing backup while testing another. Not to say that it couldn't be done, but um, it's a limitation on the testing within current ordered areas. There's also some specific provisions about where the best available control measures need to be applied. In general, um, the testing that's been done has been for use across the entire lake, but there are provisions that would address if a dust control were to be limited to specific circumstances. So a backup that was for a specific soil type um, or some other environmental condition. And similarly to modify or adjust existing backups, um, there are some specific provisions included in the SIP and board order that talk about um, the duration of the testing um, and address specific 
types of testing. So there are some requirements for shallow flood wetness cover refinement field testing, as well as for testing the reduced control efficiency of shallow flood and managed vegetation. And so down the, the testing of or development of new backum or modifications and adjustments to ex existing backum, the parameters for that is outlined in the regulatory documents. And on the other hand, we have what I'm going to refer to as alternative dust control. And that would be dust control that would be developed and utilized outside of the gray and blue areas shown here on the map. So areas outside of currently ordered areas do not need to meet the performance criteria of BACM. And so when we talk about alternative dust control, it doesn't necessarily mean that that dust control couldn't become BACM. It just potentially means that it hasn't gone through the rigorous testing required for backup consideration. Alternatively, it may not be appropriate to become a best available control measure. So it could have a lower control efficiency, um, less rigorous performance standards. Potentially because of that, it would have less disturbance um, and engineering to implement. And so for alternative dust control, that could be appropriate for environmentally sensitive areas used as temporary measures, um, transition areas. There are provisions that allow the city to move from one type of dust control to another. Some, such as moving from brine or tillage to shallow flood, the performance standards can be met continuously. Others require that the performance standards are not met. And if they're not met, the city is only allowed to transition three square miles at a time. Alternative dust control would also be appropriate for unordered lake bed sources or potentially off lake sources. <coughs> and so, kind of back to just this doesn't take into consideration other agencies' requirements, but from an air quality standpoint, the two main constraints would be anti backsliding of attainment made towards PM10 attainment as well as the limitations on development of backum. That's all I have. <clears throat> okay, so uh, next and I think we uh, have up uh, Jennifer Wong uh, from, no, am I, no, I'm sorry, wrong one. Uh, Arash, yeah. Um, my apologies from uh, LA Department of Water and Power. And then we'll move to questions for the panel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Arash Shagahi. I'm with the Capital Development Implementation Group within the uh, Owens Lake Dust Mitigation Program here at DWP. I'm going to be talking to you today about regulatory constraints, obligations, and considerations, um, and how that impacts development of future capital projects. Uh, before I jump in, just a little bit of background on me. Um, I joined the Owens Lake Group in 2014, uh, and I've overseen construction of Phase 7A, Phase 910, and I'm currently overseeing the planning of a master project. Um, I've been, uh, before I came to this group, I've been a civil designer, a structural engineer, I've been a resident engineer fighting contractors in the field, and a project manager doing bridge projects in the city of LA. And I gotta tell you, no matter what challenges I saw on those projects, um, working on Owens Lake has been truly unique. Uh, with all the different stakeholders, um, our goal is always to deliver a project that meets everybody's needs while conserving every last drop of, of the precious resource we call water. So with that, let's jump in. Um, the agenda today, I'm going to take you through a, a just a consolidated rule book um, that we consider when we develop our new project. Talk a little bit about property ownership, um, the Owens Lake Advisory Committee, and uh, what exactly is this massive project. <clears throat> so, in general, to consolidate everything, we have uh, several rules that we have to meet, right? So, first off, we have to achieve less compliance standards. That's why we're at Owens Lake. Uh, 
been mentioned that we have the SIP as our guiding document. Um, when we consider new projects, we, we look to the SIP for the different uh, criteria for the backup, whether it's brine, shallow flood, tillage, gravel. Uh, we also consider the transition limits, three square miles at a time. The district doesn't want us taking more out because obviously the more areas in construction at any given time, the more potential dust emissions. Um, we also have to maintain habitat. And when we say maintain habitat, what does that mean, right? Uh, before we started doing dust mitigation, these ponds that we, we put in were not there, right? So slowly over the years, we've added water and the birds have taken a liking to Owens Lake. And uh, so as a group of stakeholders, we've come together and we've said <coughs> that the habitat that was on Owens Lake between 2012 and 2014 is considered the baseline habitat. And that's when we talk about maintaining habitat, that's what we're referring to. <clears throat> we also need to make sure that any project mitigates impact to cultural resources. You know, when um, up for the first 10 projects we had, uh, the, the district would give us an order and we're out there um, doing work on wherever they told us to, right? Because that's where we have to uh, mitigate dust emissions. Uh, it doesn't take into account the possibility of tribal artifacts that we may find. Um, we do have an opportunity if we know a site is eligible before construction to get it removed from a project. But a lot of times, until we start construction, we don't know if we have eligible or ineligible archaeological sites. So uh, what happens during construction a lot of times is we find these sites, we end up having to design around them during construction. We keep going to stay on schedule so that we meet our dust compliance date requirements for the district. And as the archaeologists are, develop, uh, are deciding whether or not a site is eligible or ineligible, um, you know, we're, we're finishing the rest of the project. If a site is deemed eligible, we're able to remove it from that phase of construction. If it's deemed ineligible, we're required based on the SIP and the different orders we've had to do some sort of vacuum within that area. Um, one of the challenges to that is that even if a site is deemed ineligible, a lot of times it is still significant to the tribe. And so we do end up having to get creative and work out solutions uh, to make sure we're not impacting cultural resources. Uh, the state, as Phil mentioned, owns the majority of the property. That means the lake is a, a public land and uh, we have to make sure we're upholding the public trust value. We'll get into some detail on that in a little bit and obviously mitigate any other impacts to environmental resources. So uh, property ownership, just to break it down simply, uh, we have this map on the right. The TAN area represents California State Lands Commission property. The light blue is the Kansas Department of Water and Power owned property. Then we have like the purples and light blue, dark blues that represent private property owners. The way that affects us, uh, particularly during construction, is you get cases like you have here on the left. This is uh, a dust control area we call T21C that we built under the Phase 910 project, where I know a lot of you have heard of the four corners of America and the four corners of the United States of, uh, of uh, Owen Lake. So, <laughs> At the top, we have the Duck Club, privately owned uh, place for duck hunters to go during duck season. During construction, we have to keep noise levels down or else we're scaring off the ducks. On the right, we have BLM property. BLM is uh, federal land, right? So instead of doing the uh, EI environmental impact reports under the California Environmental Quality Act, NEPA applies, the National Environmental Protection Act. Down on the bottom, we have CD Roxanne, which is also known as Crystal Geyser. Crystal Geyser does not allow us to put fertilizer down. So you can see the distinct difference between uh, the California State Lands Commission property and the CD Roxanne property and how well vegetation is doing. California State Lands Commission, uh, in keeping up public trust value, does not like for us to have too many straight roads because that is not natural looking. They require us to make roads and uh, back and boundaries as sinuous as possible. So 
So that's why you see that road kind of looking like a snake. So with all these different stakeholders, <coughs> what do we do? Uh, we form an advisory committee. I think in about 2010, uh, groups representing interest in dust control, water conservation, habitat, cultural resources, public access, education, recreation, agriculture, and business came together and formed the advisory committee. The advisory committee's primary goal is to provide recommendations to DWP on how to implement future capital projects. Uh, the number one goal is to manage natural resources through monitoring and adaptive management. That's where the concept of master project came from, where we developed this master project framework. Um, the advisory committee was broken up into several subcommittees. There are three groups and then a, a, another group that feeds in that I'll talk about. Uh, the first subcommittee we should talk about is the Habitat Work Group. The main thing that came out of the Habitat Work Group was the Habitat Suitability Model. Prior to the Habitat Suitability Model, it was considered that an acre of shallow flood anywhere on the lake technically has habitat value. What the Habitat Suitability Model was, it put in, in quantifiable terms habitat value for different guilds. Basically said that if you, uh, for this guild, have a certain percentage of islands, percentage of water that's you know six inches, and a target, a salinity level, then that habitat value is actually much higher than it would have been if you just had an acre of shallow flood. This model has allowed us to uh, take some areas and convert them into um, non-water users, allow us, allowed us to put in water, allowed us to do tillage, and uh, looking forward towards master project, they've, it, it's basically the, the basis of what master project uh, will become. Uh, the, re the habitat suitability model feeds into the resource, resource protection protocols. Uh, next, we have the groundwater working group. As part of the master project, we're considering the use of groundwater below the lake um, as a source of water to uh, mitigate dust. Uh, the groundwater working group has recommended RPPs as well for the master project and is currently putting in the hydrologic monitoring management and mitigation plan, also known as the HMMP. <coughs> then we have the public access and recreation work group. Their work has been completed. Uh, back in 2014, they put together their recommendations, and uh, much of what they recommended, what, much of what they recommended, was built during the Phase 7A project. On the right here, you see the T30-1 Plaza. Um, this is the. It, it, it's a beautiful place to go. Um, people go out there to do yoga. I think I've heard of people having weddings and all kinds of things out there. So. Uh, this is basically uh, was the culmination of their recommendations. There's a couple items that were not completed that are being considered as part of master project as well. And lastly, um, everybody is also considering public resources protection. As we look towards master project, um, it's a water conservation project where we're taking all of our existing dust control areas and potentially turning them into more water neutral forms of dust control. But we have an option up front to not, not go to certain sites that we know um, have high likelihoods of hitting uh, tribal artifacts. So it's not like an order, uh, it's something that we can choose to avoid certain areas. Um, we're doing our best in the planning phase to keep the tri tribes included. Um, and then we're, there's also something happening in the background where it's a district nomination uh, where the entire lake is being nominated as a uh, archaeological district. That'll come with its own management plan and that'll get incorporated into any um, environmental documents and the future master project. During construction, we lean on our mitigation monitoring and reporting program and uh, that's worked for us so far. So in general, if you had to summarize the master project goals, uh, we want to mitigate dust emissions in compliance with governing air quality regulations. We want to reduce water use to the greatest extent possible. We want to protect cultural resources. 
We want to maintain habitat value. We're looking at replacing aging infrastructure and maintaining public trust value. In addition to the recommendations that we got from uh, all of our stakeholders, we have taken, uh, taken a look inwards. We've talked a lot with our operations and maintenance folks, our boots on the ground that really know how things work out on the lake uh, to make sure we're addressing their concerns and using their feedback in the development of any future projects. <coughs> We are taking a strong look at aging infrastructure, uh, ways to enhance efficiency and flexibility. We need to improve pond metering, instrumentation, communication, and control system. Uh, the operators even have given us site-specific recommendations where they've checked all of these 160 different dust control areas and said, hey, these are the ones with soil that's the best for tillage. Over here, we have sites that want to become brine. Let's let them go to brine. It's very salty. We have uh, gotten feedback from them on the latest meter flow data, and uh, we want to make sure we're using the right numbers and planning a future project, right? We have to know what each site uses right now to be able to tell if we're going to save water in the future. And of course, apply lessons learned from previous projects. We've also worked closely with our own biologists in optimizing habitat value acres by way of that habitat suitability model. Um, our goal is to maintain lake-wide habitat for all guilds. The biologists have told us that we really got to figure out salinity management in a big way. Um, for us, that does mean some new water in cases where we're creating habitat ponds because salinity management obviously takes a lot of water. If you have the, the lake, the majority of it, which is salty, and you're trying to make it fresh water for birds and other wildlife, then you're flushing constantly to get that salt out. Um, the biologists have also told us, hey, in areas where we have good habitat, let's not mess with that. Let's not try to convert that to anything else. Let's leave it alone. Um, they've also mentioned that some guilds benefit from summer water. Right now, we don't have summer water requirements, or we didn't before dynamic water management, but um, now, by adding some summer water, areas that previously would not have water because the, uh, the dust season was over during the summer would now have a little bit of water in the summer. That creates some challenges for us because summer is typically when we do a lot of our uh, operations and maintenance. This table down here on the bottom, it's probably difficult to see, but uh, this is a list of generic prescriptions that our biologists have put together where on the far left, there's uh, the different guilds are listed, and they have uh, basically calculated what depths each guild like. Uh, so what percentage of each site should be dry, for example? What percentage should be between 10 and 25 centimeters? What should be over 40 centimeters? They've also told us what the target salinity should be for each guild. Uh, the island proportions, uh, dry area proportions. A, a lot of work has gone into this. They've also, on a separate uh, worksheet, put together custom prescriptions for very specific sites where we know it's going to be a mix and match of different uh, types of backum. So putting all of that together uh, has been <coughs> a small feat, uh, but ultimately we we have we put together a computer algorithm and we've had numerous workshops internally. We've come up with a project, um, and so this takes into account all of the different stakeholder feedback, um, the feedback internally, and looking forward, we have a construction project on the horizon. Uh, we're still running cost-benefit analysis on it to make sure it pays for itself over time, um, but basically this is where we're at right now. So we have two areas two high habitat areas that are going to be uh, T29-1 and T13-2. This map on the right here shows only the areas that are going to be changing under this master project. We have a lot of projects that had previously been converted under the framework, um, but you can see here, it's a little bit tough to see with the lights on, but you can kind of see the different sites uh, that we're proposing to change. Um, anyway, that about wraps it up for me. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. So if we could get all the speakers uh, from the last two presentations in the morning and these two.
most recent presentations uh, to come up. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. Before I open it up to questions from people in the room, I'm going to ask people on the phone. Uh, do you have any uh, Do you have any questions for uh, for the speakers? Yeah, this is this is Scott Tyler. Just a couple of quick things um, for a variety of the speakers. So thank thank you to all of you. I um, appreciated the 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 information. Um, a, a question, just sort of an overarching question, is is what is the water consumption? Um, that's currently used. What's the what's the annual uh, amount of water that is evaporated? That is that is Owens River, or uh, I should say, fresh water that's that's being supplemented. Just to give us a right. sense of volumes. Uh, so our our latest numbers have us at approximately sixty thousand acre feet per year. Okay. That's with the implementation of several master project framework projects to date. And that does vary on a year to year basis. I think we had 45,000 acre feet in 2015, 75,000. So it, it does vary, even though the average is about 60,000 acre feet. Right. Yeah, I think the, the 2015 number is a, a little funky because we had several areas that were in construction. Um, a lot, we had tillage coming into play while we had phase 7A. So water numbers were pretty low that year. And, and then just a, just a clarification question from my side on the, the 3,600, this was brought up early on, I think I understand it, but the, the 3,600 foot elevation, uh, which is the historic lake level at the time of, of, of uh, beginning of desiccation, if you will, um, that's a regulatory number. That doesn't have anything to do necessarily with, with true lake level. Is that correct? That is correct, and it has actually now turned the regulatory shoreline. We've changed from the historic shoreline, which was used in the previous SIP documents. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. I think that's useful for all of us. Um, and then I guess just sort of the last comment is it's more of a comment, but I appreciate a couple of the speakers talking about it, and that's that's the question of, of, of salinity at the site. You know, the, all salts are not created equal from, from my perspective. And, and, and and I, I think it's important for all of us to think a little bit about, you know, why is this lake producing so much dust if you haven't been out there before? Um, you know, this is, and, and compared to the Bonneville Salt Flats and other places that, that don't produce dust, and, and, and it's really the chemistry of the dust, or the chemistry of the salt surfaces and the salts that are there that, that really play a dominant role in how the, um, uh, the system behaves and why it's, uh, why it's as dusty as it is, even though it's a fairly modern, um, Playa Lake, but I, I think that's just something important, and I appreciate. It. I think it was Grace who brought that up, kind of talking about what the, the chemistry of the salts are that are fundamentally different than than uh, than what we might think of as just pure salt, just from my perspective. But that's all I had. Thanks. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, uh, Dr. Ben Capram. Uh, yeah, this is a question for Ryan Logan. Um, I was wondering, how do you measure the effectiveness of these uh, control measures? For example, tillage. How do you know how effective it is? Are you talking about in the development of approval for the backroom, or once yes, it's approved uh, and then maintained? Let's assume that you want to put tillage instead of some other control measure. How do you measure the relative effectiveness of this? How do you know, for example, they've talked about 99% effectiveness. What does that mean in terms of I, I till the till the uh, the soil, and then how do I know it's controlling dust, and to what extent? All of the best available control measures underwent testing before they were approved by the district, and then 99% control is the control efficiency. So emissions are reduced by 99%. And so for tillage specifically. Um, the city of Los Angeles <coughs> did testing in an area on the lake called T12 um, and originally tested it for tillage to be approved as a backup with no backup. The district only approved it as a subset of shallow backup flooding, um, provided that the tillage would have the backup of shallow flooding. And so it underwent several years of testing 
during which time the control efficiencies were measured through the dust identification program, PM10 monitoring, from which the parameters that are the performance criteria were developed of the characteristics of the test, which is where we get the roughness criteria um, and the sand flux measurement. So each BACM has undergone different testing to develop the performance criteria. So the literature uh, describes this in detail somewhere. Is it that describes somewhere this, uh, this testing procedure, for example? How, how do you know it's effective? I mean, it must. You said it has it has undergone a lot of testing, correct? And so it described somewhere. Yes, there are documents that describe the testing that each BACM has undergone, and then the 2016 SIP and the board order describe the provisions for future testing. So, so why do you do the induced particle emission test using drone? I mean, that is a strange thing. Could you explain what that is? Sure, so the IPET test was a way to induce emissions by downwash of the rotors of the UAV. So it's creating basically artificial wind on the surface. Um, and there are criteria for which height those emissions are created for maintenance levels and reflood. I just wanted to add something briefly about the IPET. So a lot of the performance criteria for TWB squared as well are actually reactive tests. So you've already measured PM10. You've already measured sand flux. The armoring isn't working. The roughness isn't working. And so you have these elements where you aren't achieving backum. You aren't achieving emissions controls, but it hasn't been windy for a month. And so you're under this impression, this false impression that it's actually working. When it's not, the IPET test is the only test we have to actually proactively go out and test the surface to see if it has that durability and you know control effectiveness of the tillage. So it is it's a valuable tool. And it's a unique component to that um, performance criteria testing. Let's move on to Pratim. Okay, I think you described the number of monitors and just the quantity, right? So I was just curious. How do you decide on the location of the monitors? One question. Can you second is is this data continuous? Is it at a certain frequency? Things like that. And maybe I'll finish my question so I save some time. And are other metrics uh, measured? For example, met data, meteorological data, wind speeds, wind directions, and even PM 2.5. I think it's passing you mentioned the data available. Sure. So most of the <coughs> monitors are continuous. Um, the primary monitor used in the network around Owens Lake is a 1400 PL. Um, so we do have uh, filter based monitors um, in communities primarily. Um, so, and but the <coughs> monitors, how do you locate them? Where do you locate them? How? Sure, the, the monitoring network locations were selected over time to um, help identify sources on the lake. So they encompass you know, the regulatory shoreline, and then there were monitors placed on lake to further refine location. And that, because Installation and monitoring of PM10 sites, especially to EPA criteria, is a very expensive and time-consuming endeavor. That's why the dust identification program was developed, which is the um, monitoring of horizontal sand movement. So that, in combination with the ambient air monitoring, helps with the identification of source areas for control. And all of the PM10 sites have meteorological monitoring. There are several additional sites that are just met data only. Um, the primary <coughs> variables of importance are wind speed and wind direction because that's what drives emissions on Owens Lake. But temperature, relative humidity, barometric pressure are also measured at some sites. Point five. Do you look at that data? We have PM2.5 in Keeler. In compliance this much? Or? No. No. But we are um, unclassified for PM 2.5 designation. 
Hi. Uh, so, uh, I have one question for Arash. Uh, so, you mentioned about the baseline habit, uh, sorry, the fertilizer using fertilizer in one side versus the other side. Right. Um, and I know there's groundwater uh, underneath one leg. So, are you guys like testing while well, you're using these fertilizers? Is it impacting your groundwater quality or is this actually a part of the discussion? And I'm asking you because then if the DB Roxanne, right, that was the name. Yeah. Um, if they are depending on the same groundwater basin, that's why they don't want you to use fertilizer. Uh, the groundwater basin right. is all connected, so it doesn't matter if you put them on there. Right. I think we're in the amount of fertilizer that we use for our managed vegetation is minimal. Uh, I don't think there's any concern on our part that we're impacting the groundwater supply. Not that location, although that's where you see the CD rock sands property. Where they're pulling the water from is actually quite a bit of ways away. So that's their just processing facility? That's their pro and they actually offload probably quite a bit of other materials that they're pulling out of the water. And In that they're, they're, yeah, they're doing their own thing over there. That's probably far worse than anything we're doing. Good enough. Um, <laughs> and, then, um, and then I had one other question with Jennifer. You men mentioned the tillage, and I think you sort of touched on that later. So you said uh, the maintenance level for tillage is very, very low, right? Like you put it there, and it's great. And that's as long as it's performing and meeting the bathroom criteria that Anne was mentioning about. But should there be an issue where, you know, especially dependent on weather conditions, um, you know, certainly high wind and rain can negatively impact the integrity of the ridges. And that's not to say that, that the area is going to be emissive, just to say that it won't meet the criteria for ridge height. And so it might melt down. It's also very heavily dependent on soil type as well. Because I think, I forget who mentioned, but the tillage areas, there's a range of soils. It could be clay, it could be more sandy. So then obviously they're still all held to the same criteria. So there are times when there is some type of degradation of the ridges and then it'll slough off into the furrows, which the job of the furrows basically is to also help catch any of that sand that's either coming from outside the area or potentially catching that, that material that's being sloughed off from the ridges. So the purpose of us, you know, going through existing furrows to push up and out that same material back onto the ridge height. So, and, and really, so, I mean, we always try to be preemptive in any type of maintenance. I mean, certainly we don't want to get a, a nasty gram from Ann or Bill, definitely. We don't want them to have to tell us to do our homework. Like, we should be able to have eyes on the ground, and that's what we do. We have eyes on the ground who are monitoring the health, and also, too, there's also part of the requirements in monitoring. There's, there's people out there all the time checking on these areas, and then so depending on what they see, um, I think we've developed a very good relationship with the district in that, in that way, especially with Nick Barbieri, who's not Nick Barbieri, who's not here right now, but he's actually kind of the lead on the district side for being in the field. So there's a very good relationship there where we can talk to each other and say, hey, you know, we're noticing that there's some areas that maybe need a little bit of work. What do you think? And we schedule a field visit, go out there, and then depending on what is being recommended to us by Nick and the guys out in the field who know best, they'll determine whether what level of maintenance we need to do. So it could be simply as going through the existing furrows, it could be tilling the inner road, or if more is needed, then we're gonna to have to go up to the next level, which is leveling it, retilling or flooding it. So I just have one last question on this, which is um, you have a lot of different kind of infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. Going down the list, which one of these back ends have the least amount of infrastructure, like man-made infrastructure, but they have the highest effectiveness. And I know you might not have measured it that way, but just on top of your mind, just trying to figure out like how. Well, you know, and I and required less sort of, which I, where I'm getting at is like then required less amount of repairing mm -hmm. after a rain event or a flood event or something like that, that you can quickly sort of maybe bring a few equipment and make it work again mm -hmm. rather than I think, well, definitely, okay. the back end pipes that have the least amount of infrastructure would be our, our gravel areas, because simply we don't have really any infrastructure out there, right? I, there is some drainage or culverts through some of the berm roads. Um, in terms of uh, gravel maintenance, 
we're certainly able to respond and we have, and I think in my picture, I had different uh, mechanisms, mechanical mechanisms to be able to uh, basically kind of like do maintenance on that area. Uh, but I would also say brine areas because, you know, the lake naturally, and you know, when, when you guys see that map with that big brine tool in the middle, a lot of the, I mean, the lake will do what it wants to do. And a lot of areas naturally wants to go towards the briny side. So, uh, you know, we do have currently existing brine areas. Uh, there's other areas that are shallow flood, but certainly, you know, are tending more towards the saline side. So, I mean, you know, we would prefer to let the lake do what it wants to do, and that is over time, you know, become a brine area potentially. So, thank you. Greg, uh, then Roya, then Scott, and then we'll cut off questions. Um, I think I, I, I'd be interested in talking about some of the detailed stuff with iPad and Sandflex monitoring and other things, because, but I don't want to take the time there. I'd, I'd rather use this time to, to ask a sort of a big picture question, which is, um, it, it's clear that there's no one thing that works every place, right? And it's clear that there's no one thing that works at all times if you think of an interannual time scale, a long decade old time scale. Um, I'd actually like to hear from each of you, uh, in your opinion, what's not working? Right, what's the biggest, what's the thing that needs the most, uh, that, that is the most dissatisfactory for you for some reason? So it might be, um, at, you know, LADWQ's perspective, they can use the most water. But anyway, I'd like to know kind of which is the most dissatisfactory method. I'll start. You want to start? <laughs> <laughs> we call them love letters, by the way, not national. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I won't use that next time. Sorry. <laughs> so for me, it's it's the things that keep me up at night, and those things are sometimes unknown, but they're the things that you have concerns about. So it's tillage areas that maybe aren't quite meeting the performance criteria that we expect and they're changing or a specific event changes that like a, a rain event. And so that day it may be tillage. Um, the next day, if you had a fire in a managed veg area, there is no veg and so that area becomes completely emissive. So it will change that day. Um, what we've experienced in the past, we had a jet crash in the shallow flood area. And within 15 days that became um, the largest source on the lake causing exudances in Keeler. And so it was that shallow flood area. You know, you think of gravel and you're like, okay, gravel the end all until you have the inundation. And then that inundated in sand or that blow sand then becomes a source. And so they all, each and every one of them have their own strengths <clears throat> and then kind of vulnerabilities. And so for me, it, it really does change. Okay. Um, I'll mention two things. Uh, one, I think Jaime touched on it in his presentation, uh, in sprinkler shallow flood areas, a lot of times uh, we know the area is soaking wet, but when the satellite flies over, uh, it does not hit 75% wet. The operators and maintenance folks go out to the field, they sink into their knees because the ground is so saturated, yet, um, you know, it, it, we're not given uh, we're not that area is not considered compliant unless we're hitting our 75 percent wet targets um i think another item is probably the 95 percent confidence interval for uh, managed vegetation um where we have other measurements um where we you know it, it's area, certain areas that are compliant if you take away that 95 percent compliance interval um suddenly are not compliant just based on that strict requirement. Actually, I think, I think for me, I think, um, well, I guess there's two things, but I already touched on the use of sprinklers, sprinkler shallow flood. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have super saturated um, soil to abate dust. Um, we feel that there's a range of soil moistures that can do the job. Um, but we don't necessarily get credit for that. Uh, what we do get credit for is the, um, you know, the satellite that goes around every eight days and what that picks up. I think part of what um, influences what the wetness coverage is, is also soil types. I mean, we have some like lytic soil that for some reason, it, you know, you could go out there, it's wet, there's one area like T184, you have these really salty soils, 
and you know you think it's this, it's going to pass, but then it doesn't. And then it's like, what the heck's going on here? So trying to understand, like, why is it not necessarily working out in the field? Like, you can be on the ground and you can see it, it's wet, but when it shows up on the satellite imagery, it doesn't. So what are those factors that are contributing to it? I think I think it's very important to kind of a little bit better understand that and also ranges of soil moisture. I think also for tillage, I think it's very important. I think, as you guys saw, there's a lot of performance criteria, right, that will dictate whether or not a tillage area is compliant or not. There is room in the stipulated, um, or I should say in the st or stipulated judgment for revisions to those uh, thresholds for compliance. Um, I think, and definitely I don't mean to say, I think working with a district, there's been plenty of times where, you know, it, it technically fails, but we work together and, you know, they haven't issued us a refloat order. They let us do what we thought would work best for that area. But I do think that there's some room to kind of look, take a look at those super conservative thresholds and really understand how is tillage working? I, I think like when we talk about some of the ridge height and ridge spacing and whether or not it's working or not, like I, I think tillage does work, even if it doesn't give you that ridge height, because I think stuff gets trapped in those furrows and it's not leaving the site. I mean, if you're trying to gauge whether or not it's emitted at the regulatory shoreline, you know, is it? it? Is it picking up from these tillage areas? I, 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 think, I, I think for me, I think that's one of the biggest things that would not let me sleep at night is just thinking about some of the, the conservative criteria and, and you know being able to work together to maybe make some refinements that better match what's actually happening out in the field. To carry on from what Jennifer is saying, um, I think for me, you know, providing the alternative perspective, um, there are probably performance criteria that are too conservative, but. And I understand from the city's perspective that that's frustrating in terms of operation, maintenance, um, this, you know, field staff who's reporting that, you know, this appears that it's working, but it's not meeting the performance criteria. But from the regulatory perspective, the performance criteria are, you know, it's a, a fine line because you have to have confidence that they'll work. And like it's still discussed earlier, if we have emissions, from tillage or sprinklers, which are kind of my two primary concerns, it's too late. You know, we haven't demonstrated attainment. And so in terms of refining backhome, developing new backhome, it's really important that those parameters don't get pushed too far that we're having emissions, having exceedances. And so, you know, in development of dust controls, it's important that the you know, the testing is done such that there's a margin of safety for the environmental conditions that cause exceedances. And most of the time, those conditions don't exist, and so there aren't emissions. And so it can seem that the criteria are too stringent when, in fact, perhaps they aren't. Okay, let's move on to Roya for a quick question and then Scott for a quick question. Sure. Thanks for the opportunity. So I guess my question is related to some of the things that have been discussed so far, but I'd like to clarify something. If I understand correctly, different backgrounds are in place because different surfaces have different emissivities. And each backgrounds basically gets tested before it's um, sort of deployed at the larger scale. But for exceedance evaluations, we're going by PM10 monitors that are along the shoreline, right? So my question is, during the times that there are exceedances, is there a way, has the district looked at different ways to sort of decipher that data and try to understand which areas and which backgrounds are the ones that are not maybe performing to the expectations, basically? In terms of analysis of monitored federal exceedances, areas that are under control are not currently con contributing to those exceedances. Um, that there is an evaluation done to ensure that that doesn't happen, but the exceedances tend to be caused or contributed by areas below the regulatory shoreline that are not controlled, um, off lake sources, and sometimes regional events that move into the PM10 planning area. Uh, do you have a sense of what the proportion of those different categories are, which is most important? That's a 
varies annually. So different meteorological conditions can create, you know, different types of exceedances. But I'd say, you know, as far as a trend, we've moved from um, the majority of exceedances being caused by sources below the regulatory shoreline to now below the regulatory shoreline, the magnitude and frequency of those exceedances has significantly declined to less than a dozen a year. Um, but still, the standard is one sure. per year. Yeah. And off-lake sources are now higher in magnitude than on-lake sources. Okay, a uh, quick question from Scott. Yeah, um, I've got a quick question and then a, a, a comment. Um, we've heard the term durability time and time again, and yet there's been no hard time scale what's considered to be durable as far as the treatments are concerned. That's one of the things that's in our, our task statement is we have to be able to assess according to durability. Ideas on that from both parties? <laughs> Thanks, Jan. <laughs> I think it depends on what perspective you're you're coming at what the definition of durability means. If you're looking at the operations and maintenance, it, it's probably just a cost to benefit for the amount of time that you can get out of that dust control you put into place. So, you know, if the you put in tillage versus gravel potentially the durability of gravels much more significant than that of tillage. However, um, if the gravels put in a place where there are other off lake or contributing sources and it's inundated with sand, then the durability is next to nothing where tillage then can actually absorb some of that inundation and then it lasts longer. Um, and not just in Durability is in like the physical properties of something, but the durability is in that dust control being able to effectively control emissions. So, like shallow flooding, um, that's meeting 75% wetness, you meet that 99% control efficiency requirement, and it's very, very effective. We don't measure any emissions, um, very successful. However, if you turn off the valve, and within six or seven days, you can have emissions. So the durability of that dust control, um, if the infrastructure isn't in place, is very minimal. However, the long-term durability of it as a dust control method has been very successful because of the availability of water um, and the infrastructure that's been put in place. So this is a challenging question to answer. Okay. All right, just to add to that, um, most of our projects to date, uh, most of the orders that we got had very tight time frames, really quick turnaround where we had to put together a design. Uh, well, first get a designer on board, put together a design, get it out to bid and award, do construction in about a year and a half um, on these massive dust control areas. That didn't leave a lot of time for considering what's best for the lake, what the lake wants to do itself. It's whatever we can do, let's go do it uh, before we get a fine from the Great Basin. So for years, um, it's, hey, we're, we're out there. While we're in construction in one phase, we're already in design for the next phase. Maybe we'll catch the lessons learned by the phase after that. Now, we have uh, about 20 years of doing this. We've got a lot of lessons learned. We have a, a chance to take our time with some of our designs. Um, Jennifer mentioned it. Let's look at what the lake wants to be. And as we look towards master project, we are considering that. Uh, that big effort from our operators to go out there and say, hey, this is a great site for tillage. The soils are going to are gonna stand up here. You know, high clay, you're going to get great clods versus this site over here. Let's, let's never put a habitat area here because it's so saline, so briny. And if we ever wanted to do tillage, we, we couldn't even get equipment in there. Um, listening to the lake, you know, as cheesy as that sounds, is really kind of what's going to drive our, our durability moving forward. Uh, as phases have progressed, we've, we've put in, um, we've shifted materials, we're using a lot of like stainless steel, um, HDPE plastics. Uh, the corrosive environment does not help, right? It's destroying our infrastructure little by little. But um, the operators and maintenance folks really have gained a lot of experience. We've gained a lot of experience from our project 
and, and we have to incorporate that into whatever we do from now on. Okay, so thanks to all of our speakers, we're going to need to move on before.